I'm Jeremy Barker, director of the Religious Freedom Institute's Middle East Action Team. The mission of RFI is to achieve a broad acceptance of religious liberty as a fundamental human right, the cornerstone of a successful society, and a source of national and international security. We put this mission into practice in the United States and around the world through five action teams and our Center for Religious Freedom Education. Today I'll be talking with Mr. Ayman Abdel Noor, the president of, the, of Syrian Christians for Peace, a tax exempt organization in the US and EU, who works both with Syrians inside and outside the country, and is a frequent commentator and lecturer, lecturer on the situation in Syria. We'll be talking about the, the situation and the impact of COVID-19 in Syria. So Ayman, thank you so much for joining me today. Hello, Jeremy, and hello for all the viewers. It's great to have you on, though um, not the best of circumstances, but no. thank you for, for joining. Um, how has the, the COVID-19 crisis impacted Syria over these past few weeks? I think there is uh, the case is unique in Syria because the fighting uh, for the COVID-19, it doesn't start from a normal situation of life like other countries start accompanied directly with the people inside a civil war and inside a big uh, uh, aggression from the regime against its own people. So it starts from under the zero, the situation yeah. economic, economically. I will give you just one example. The electricity came to all the houses. The best places are in Damascus. It came for two hours and then cut off for four hours. Then it will go for two hours, then cut for four hours. So that's the best situation. In the other cities, it may not come at all. So just imagine the prices are high, the poverty uh, percentages are 40% less than zero. Uh, so it's very, very bad situation to be in while you need to fight the coronavirus so uh, the government issued many uh, restrictions for flights for the border crossing for the uh, movement between the urban and rural areas between different governorates there's curfew after 6 p.m to till uh, 6 a.m in the morning uh, the foods there's a shortage because of the uh, problems uh, in syria so that's that's all gathered together and uh, that hit very bad the poor people and the vulnerable ones and the minorities. So that's uh, different than other countries. Yeah, I think that that context is so important to understand. Um, when you do think about the, the minorities, whether that's the, the Christian community in particular or um, places like in Lib where the humanitarian needs are just so huge, what are the particular challenges that those communities are facing? As I told you, it's it's uh, it's a complex of many things happened at the same time. Number one, the uh, currency dropped uh, by half in the mm. last uh, two months only. So uh, they cannot afford to buy the food. I will just give you one example. If you want, the the one kilo of meat is sixteen thousand Syrian pounds and the average salary is 50,000. So with your salary that you work for one full month, month full time, you can buy only three kilos of meat. Wow. So how are you going to feed your kids, your family, and especially we just finished the Easter for the Christians. Yeah. And the problem also because of the sanctions against the regime, the Syrians abroad and the uh, Christian churches cannot send and wire or send through bank or through Western Union uh, uh, any money for the families there or for the churches to be distributed inside to give, let's say, a food baskets. So that's also another thing. But let me tell you, U.S., even though fighting the uh, virus here at home they are the one that leading all the humanitarian efforts in the world they dedicate 18 million dollars for the syrian and they just dropped the 16.1 million dollars as a help for uh, in the communication uh, basket food humanitarians for all the areas so they are the one that leading those efforts with the who world health organization and with the un organization too so there's an effort to at least ease uh, the situation of the vulnerable people and the minorities. And uh, one of the important issue I want to mention that uh, the uh, Treasury, 
in U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, issued a very uh, detailed uh, statement uh, saying how is the sanctions, the U.S. sanctions and the, all the EU sanctions against the Syrian regime. It doesn't affect the uh, supplies of the medical supplies, medical equipment, the masks, the ventilators and the food. So uh, this is not, uh, uh, the, the regime cannot justify this, uh, that uh, the co total collapse of economy is because of the sanctions. No, it's because mm -hmm. of the corruption of the bad administration and because they are stealing the money of the people, the regime. So that's, that's the situation. Yeah, that's very important uh, context and clarification for, for combating the, the medical, the public health dimension of this to, to understand that distinction. Uh, you mentioned the Easter holiday for Christians. The Ramadan uh, month is about to begin for the Muslim community. Um, for the Yazidis, they just celebrated their New Year as well. How has this crisis impacted the behavior, the practices of, of religious communities in particular? Yes, that's the uh, a big problem because it's for the first time the uh, public gathering inside the churches and the mosques are banned from the government. So uh, it was okay with the regular days, but now with Ramadan, it's on a daily basis. Should be after the uh, finish the fast every day, they should go. Let's say for Salat at Tarawih, they call it for at Tarawih mm -hmm. prayers. So this is all banned, including in in Saudi, in the holiest place, which is Mecca. So uh, that's that's uh, till now. It's uh, the regulation. It wasn't easy by the government. As for the Easter, the churches all they did the prayers online, hmm. and they stream it through Facebook. Uh, and many different uh, other softwares. And one of the nice issues they did, and I attended here, the shwar uh, was done, each one from his house. So uh, we didn't miss that too. It was available online. So, and that was good. The preaches also was done uh, online and uh, also through the satellite channels. Hmm. So some of the satellite channels provided that services that they dedicated certain hours for the Christians so that they can, they can broadcast it through satellite, so through TV. So you can see it on a better HD on your TV or on TV at the house instead of going uh, going to the internet and there's had so bad connections in Syria. So that's also was a very bad and thank you for all the TV uh, channels that participated in that uh, project. So it's the situation, uh, there's curfew. There is mm -hmm. the uh, border crossing still, uh, it, it's not opened. The flights all are grounded. Uh, they, they, but they, the government uh, allowed the small shops and the small businesses to reopen. Okay. The, uh, let me give you just the uh, amount, the number of the cases the government uh, announced are 42. The fatality are only three. Okay. But this, uh, certain NGOs and non-government organizations, they work and they went to s some hospital many, in many different cities and collect the information. They announced the number is 424 hmm. and the fatalities are 37 and six are recovered. So that's the uh, latest number till yesterday. Okay. And um, you mentioned kind of the dis differences in response and information coming from the government, from the NGOs, international organizations. From your perspective, what things can um, can NGOs, the international organizations, as well as the governments be doing to uh, more effectively help these communities and particularly those most vulnerable? That's very important questions because till now the UN organization and the WHO failed to meet the demand for all the cities and the minorities. Why? Because they are dealing only with the government which is in Damascus and the places that they are telling them to work in. So they ship many uh, shipment to Damascus, but they failed to send any to Idlib, mm. which is the northwest, and they failed to send anything for the Kurds in the northeast. So just yesterday I was talking with the leaders of the Kurds. They told me they didn't receive any single shipment from the test kits. They don't have ventilators and no PPP and uh, no equipment to fight the COVID-19. And they have 10,000 from ISIS in the jail. So if any broke out of the pandemic, then the 10,000, they cannot do anything for them. 
and they are in crowded in a small area so that's uh, the regime didn't allow the UN to send them and they still into discussion this is they need to send it in the uh, uh, through the uh, uh, border crossing either Simalka from uh, Iraq or through Turkey because they need to deliver it as soon as pos possible otherwise th there's a big risk also the same for Idlib in the northwest also, they received but very, very small 112 test kit only, which is it's not enough for the labs to, to do a big testing campaign. And they, they don't have any uh, equipment or ventilators. So that's the situation is not prepared for any breakout there in that region. Yeah, and the, the number of people in those areas is is way beyond the amount of resources that are there. Right. So, well, thank you so much for joining. Any last points to highlight for, for the viewers on this issue? Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. All right. Well, thank you, Ayman. And for those who are looking to learn more about the Religious Freedom Institute, you can visit us online at www.rfi.org. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for all. Thank you. Bye-bye.